Uh, thank you, conference. It's really uh, wonderful to be here. As Peter says, I've not been on the channel or anywhere apart from my <laughs> outside my own front door for the last uh, few months. And as I speak, it'll become obvious why. Um, I'm going to start with a story. Okay, one of two uh, that I'm going to that I'm going to say tell today. This little tale is about a British academic called Pete Newbon. Pete's specialism was Victorian literature, but he was also a campaigner against anti-Semitism. Understandably enough, there's a lot of Jew hate out there, and Pete was Jewish. In May 2021, he found himself in a social media spat with another Jew, political activist, poet, and broadcaster, Michael Rosen. Now, you might be familiar with the case. Newborn referenced Rosen's work ironically to make a point about Jeremy Corbyn and the anti-Semitic radical left. In response, Rosen, a big fan of St. Jeremy, actually accused Newborn of anti-Semitism. Then all hell broke loose, and Newborn received a torrent of online abuse from the usual be kind Corbynista suspects. But it didn't stop there, because 4,000 of them complained to his employer, the University of Northumbria. The university subsequently carried out an investigation, which was, according to the spectator, a tale worthy of Kafka. It resulted in a final written warning. Amid various types of further fallout, Pete Newman Pete Newborn decided that he'd had enough. On January the 15th, 2022, he committed suicide. He was 38 years old. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you to Cancellation Britain. It's a dangerous place. Ask Graham Linehan. He lost everything because he spoke out against the madness of gender. Ask a certain ex-teacher at the Batley Grammar School. Well, you couldn't actually, even if you wanted to, because he's still in hiding, frightened for his life. The education authorities, he says, threw him under the bus. And that, for me, sums up cancel culture. Bullying. Cowardice. People left vulnerable, thrown under the bus. The Khan Review, published a couple of weeks ago, draws attention to the cancel culture problem. I'm quoting, okay? There's a growing and dangerous climate of harassment and censorship which is undermining not only people's ability to live their lives and speak freely, but also censoring institutions and the wider society. The review was commissioned by the current Conservative administration, and it's only a decade or so behind the rest of us with all of this kind of stuff. So they're doing pretty well, really. Better late than never. Uh, no, I'm not being quite fair there. It was commissioned in 2021, and it is an important document. So is the CAS review, published just last week. In it, consultant paediatrician Dr. Hilary Cass identifies a culture of fear in the NHS. Her findings are shocking, as I'm sure you know. Put bluntly, cancel culture prevented professionals from voicing concerns at medical intervention in the name of genderism. Vulnerable children, therefore, were left at the mercy of ideologues and fanatics. It's a characteristic of our time. People stand by as safeguarding flies out the window. Society nods along as youngsters are told they are born in the wrong body. Born in the wrong body. Have you ever heard anything so daft? But this is what happens when behavior is governed by fear. People are coerced into doing things they don't want to do. They say things they know to be false. And parents, well, 
they find themselves rationalising abomination. It's the same with other culture war issues, by the way. Society cheers along net zero, knowing full well it will make us poorer and curtail our freedoms. Politicians talk of Islamophobia when the nation's Jews, fearful of their property and children, are looking to emigrate at the first possible opportunity. And let's not forget the move to introduce autogynophilic men into women's toilets, sports and prisons. All in the name of inclusion, all in the name of kindness. It's an obscene reversal of values. It's our world turned upside down. If someone could answer that phone, it'd be great. <laughs> it's off. Congratulations. Right. Over the last few years, we've seen a sharp increase in political activism. And the activism has become increasingly belligerent in nature. So much so, you'd be forgiven for thinking that it's out of control. If you sense fear, there's that word again, in the way the Saturday hate marches are policed, then I'd say it's a safe bet that you're onto something. There are many reasons why the fabric of our society is in tatters, why the common bond of citizenship is broken, why hatred for Britain and the West more generally parades itself naked on our streets. Mass immigration in the millions is a reason. Our useless government is a reason. The hostile civil service is a reason. And they're all connected. But I'm going to focus on another reason, similarly connected and part of the same picture, because I think it's of monumental significance. And it provides a nice segue into the second little story that I'm going to tell you. That reason is the obsession with activism in our universities. Activism is now the cornerstone of the curriculum in arts, humanities and social sciences. It's an end in itself. It's the end in every sense of the word. It's a major driver of cancel culture. Just visualise, if you will, the typical activist youngster. Let's call them Jaunty or Jemima Ponsonby Smythe. <laughs> it's just a name, I don't know why you're laughing. They are, of course, non-binary, committed socialists, and avid green campaigners. Straight back from a gap year, funded by mummy and daddy, in which they've flown all around the world. They're now ready for the university experience. It's terribly exciting because they can read, wait for it, degrees in activism. What a lovely way to put the cherry on the luxury belief cake. One master's level course, I won't mention the institution, has words like peace, resilience and social justice in the title. I would wager it promotes none of those things. What do you need to get on it? A 2-2 undergraduate degree and just four GCSEs at grade C. Easy, that's the future for our Ponsonby Smythe offspring sorted. But it isn't just the degrees themselves, however substandard they might be. After all, it would be your choice to sign up to such a course. No, it's the individual study modules within degrees and pretty much all degrees. That's the problem. Because as a student, and don't get me wrong, there are tons and tons of brilliant students out there. As a student, you'll be compelled to engage with the social justice misnomer, no matter what you study. Really, you've no idea how pervasive this stuff really is. Here are just a few countless examples. An open university module, social justice, equity and equality. King's College London, social justice and policy analysis. University of Sussex, 
social justice, leadership and organising. Birkbeck, social justice. York, social justice and education. Dundee, action and social justice. West Scotland, social activism and social justice. And so on and so on. You throw key words like gender, identity and race into the mix and you're faced with education Armageddon. There's no end to it, it's everywhere. Imagine trying to stand up against this stuff. You can't, there is no balance. No ear for an alternative narrative. Staff or student, you just get canceled. Which brings me to my second story and unfortunately, it's about me. I'm going to tell you what it's like to be targeted by activists and hauled over the coals as a result. I can't give you details of professional context just yet because I'm still under investigation at work. But I can tell you how it feels. I can communicate something of that 21st century phenomenon, the personal fallout of wrong thing. It's not all doom and gloom, by the way. When you're looking down the gun barrel of professional and financial disaster, you grab the laughs where you can find them, and you find them in some bloody funny places, I can tell you. Cancellation can happen to the best of us. Recently, Dan Wooten was investigated by two British police forces in response to complaints about him. That he was completely exonerated is, of course, wonderful news for Dan, but it'll be a while before the wounds start to heal. None of that matters, of course, to his social media tormentors. As far as they're concerned, he's guilty as sin. His crime? Association with GB News. I'm guilty of the same. I'm also affiliated with an education institution. Once the trolls clocked that little connection, it was only a matter of time before they landed me in the cancellation mincer. Which is precisely where I found myself one Tuesday, late last December. The day had started badly with searing pain from an abscess on my gum. By mid-afternoon, Dental problems were the least of my worries. All of a sudden, I was fighting for my professional life and weighing vague alternatives to the future that had just been flushed down the toilet. It was traumatic, sure, but it was also actually liberating. And this is what I mean by not all doom and gloom. And this is where my story differs from Dan's. He was robbed of a career that he loved, I look like saying goodbye to a sector that had become alien to me. So when I got the formal email, we need to talk about your social media commentary and your media commentary, I felt a bewildering combination of fear and relief. Yes, I was worried about my mortgage. Yes, I was worried about feeding myself, not to mention Bobby, my portly feline companion. But I'm old enough to spot an opportunity when I see it, even one cloaked in disaster. I was excited by the turn of events, genuinely excited. Why then did I keep fantasizing about throwing myself from the top of the highest car park in Leeds? Mental health website Very Well Mind says cancellation can feel as if everyone is giving up on you before you've even had the chance to apologise, let alone change your behaviour. I wasn't apologising to anyone, and I certainly wasn't going to change my behaviour. As far as I was concerned, I'd done nothing wrong. But the car park was never far from my thoughts. Odd, or so it seemed at the time. The run-up to Christmas was something of a fraught affair with me shouting and bawling one minute, quietly weeping the next, up and down, round and round, mentally and physically exhausting for me and everyone in my orbit. That said, I never lost sight of the absurdity of the situation. What really brought it home was a student evaluation exercise on one of my modules taught the previous semester. I was at home when the results pinged in the email. 
48 students enrolled on the module, 44 took the survey. Overall satisfaction came in at 98%. One comment read, the atmosphere was welcoming and inclusive. Should I have been angry at the unfairness of it all? Yeah, maybe, I don't know. I just had a bloody good laugh. The festive season came and went, and still I carried the, my favorite car park around in my head. One day in early January, I decided to pay it a visit. I pressed my trousers, polished my Chelsea boots, and took time choosing a shirt and tie. I sprayed some Aqua de Palma, my favorite aftershave, and jumped in a cab. There was never any question of me doing anything drastic, incidentally. I wasn't in exactly an oasis of calm, but I wasn't at the end of my tether either. I just wanted to know. As I looked at the lead skyline, I puzzled over two compl uh, competing scenarios in my mind. In one, I plunged to my death and embraced the gift of oblivion. In the other, I bounced on the ground, cartoon style, and strutted away, rubbing my rump. <laughs> then I solved the mystery. None of this was literal. It was instead symbolic. I was working through the fear of leaping into the unknown, coming to terms with starting afresh. Once that penny dropped, I breathed a sigh of relief. All very obvious, I know, but sometimes circumstances make it difficult for you to know yourself. Okay, enough of the dollar book, Freud. There's good news. We're going to win. Not tomorrow, not next week, but we are going to win. People are waking up to the consequences of keeping quiet while bullies and big mouths call the shots. But waking up isn't enough. We need to do something about it. When activism becomes pathological, as it always does when, say, women and Jews are the targets, we need to make a stand. We need to make a stand for children. If we don't, nobody else will. The institutions will just look on stupidly. They'll rewrite history when they see the tables are turning, as they are doing now with gender. And the institutions will continue to play the part of the coward in the cancellation drama. So we've got to make noise and get organised. We've got to sign petitions and vote for the smaller parties. We've got to worry at the biggest challenges of our time, mass immigration and genderism. We know all that. But what do you do if you find yourself cancelled as a result of that action? At work, by an organisation to which you're affiliated or on the board of, by a charity you're involved with, by a school at which you're a governor, by anyone or anything that wants to shut down your freedom of expression. Okay, this is what you do. First, come to terms. Take a deep breath. Get in touch with the Free Speech Union. Find out who's attacking you. Find out where your employer stands. Tell friends and family. I can't, I can't emphasize that enough. Two, start your fight back. Think about your employer. Go through emails, look over minutes, find any irregularity you can. And I mean everything, your whole time there. Anything can be ammunition. Really, this is war. Keep a diary of day-to-day -day events. Keep an eye on broader context. It might help. Genderism is imploding, remember? And if they're out to get you for that, the chances are you can get them. Tactics. Question everything. Give them work to do. Bombard them with requests for clarification and information. Pounce on any slip-up. Be prepared for the long haul. ACAS and all the rest of it. Be prepared to go to press if you can face it. And five, never, ever apologize. Finally, 
make sure you belong to an organized and sympathetic community. In other words, join NCF locals. <laughs> Don't face the juggernaut alone. It could be fatal. I'll make a promise to you here and now. If your employer sacks you or disciplines you, throws you under the bus for expressing perfectly legitimate opinions, I'll write a letter of protest. We should all write letters of protest again and again. Take that cancellation tactic and turn it on its head. If you're cancelled, I'll be there for you. I'll listen to you because you've been there for me in Manchester, Nottingham, Leeds, all over the place. Thank you, NCF Locals. Thanks, everybody. It's good to be back. It's bloody good to see you again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philip. Uh, any questions for Philip? Yes, lady here, and then the gentleman behind. Lady right down here in the full row. Can you keep your points brief, please? Thank you. Philip, thank you for that. You've just given my story. I'm very emotional. I've been cancelled by my employer, a large insurance giant whose CEO got into hot water at the back end of last year um, in front of a parliamentary select committee. However, I've done what you said. I got the free speech union involved. I've fought back. I'm currently negotiating an exit. I will be going to the media. Um, I'm a Reform UK candidate. Um, and I w it was because of my political beliefs, yeah. which are protected under law. Um, so yeah, that really spoke to me and I, feel, I still feel very emotional about it. I'll speak to you later about it. But my question is this. Um, I think the big issue we have with this is a lot of it is baked into the ESG agenda and the Equalities Act. So how do we dislodge that? Yeah, I mean, I've spoken about um, various ways of dealing with, with the broader context in, in, in other contexts, actually. So in the, the last speeches I've made, and, I, and, I've, and I've published quite extensively about that. What I wanted to do here was just speak to act, actually exactly people like you and think about the, the nuts and bolts of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, especially when you wake up on a Monday morning you think I've got another week of this hanging over me and I can't say anything I can't do anything and so on and so forth I think actually that the broader contest just is is just a a, a, a macrocosm of, of what I've just talked about it's we need to be organized and this is one of the things that 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 we don't do on on the conservative right we, we tend to this is one of the reasons why I've actually been you know, extremely personal about this. I wouldn't ordinarily do that, and I was just wondering how this would go across. But it feels the other side has hijacked the language uh, and, has, and has made actually kind of communicating with people ludicrous. So what I wanted to do was just talk about it in absolute plain English, but it's that idea of communication. And I think as I say, we need to get organised on a grassroots level, which we do, and from a grassroots level, then we can, we can hit the, 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 the broader context. We can't do it in any other way. We've tried and tried for years for doing things and, and, and just having you know, international <coughs> conferences and talking and ideas and sharing. Yes, that's all well and good, and we do need to do that, but it's the grassroots stuff that we've started with NCF Locals. It's the grassroots stuff, actually, which is the free speech union. And it's that wave, that energy from people which will change things. So while I'm talking about specifics and individuals like me and you, I'm also talking about the broader picture in another way as well. Okay. Uh, gentlemen, uh, 
Uh, the question I was going to ask is, just, is a, there's a particular weapon in the armoury that we can use a lot more of if you were to do a national campaign across the country, which is using the Freedom of Information Act to start exposing institutions, yeah. the claims they're making, the evidence they're making, where they're getting definitions from. So, for example, critical race theory, where's the legal basis of it? What is structurally racist? Yeah. Can you provide evidence? So if you can have a, ask a whole range of deconstructing questions, get the official response from organisations across the country and expose it for the rubbish it is when vacuous. If, again, you have to be very tight with your wording, but you could do, you could get yourself on the front foot, uh, those institutions on the back foot by that type of campaign. Is that something that we need to do a lot more of? It's yeah. cheap as well. I, I, I think it is, because one of the things it really does do is give them work. It gives them tons and tons of bloody labour. Now, that's one of their weapons. That's what they do to us, OK? They target us with freedom of information and all of these things. We need to fight back. The, 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 the time for being above all that is, is, is long gone. We need to make sure that they have all the work they've got. They've got all the worry they've got. And if it does kind of drag these things out, then it will drag these things out in a better way rather than just you worrying and waiting. So, yes. Yes, I'm all for that. That's another tactic and, it, and it's something that I would add. I mean, I, I would say also the things that I've just said there, you, you're probably not going to remember them. But if something is happening to you, I mean it, just, just get in touch with me and we can have a conversation. Because um, I think it's incredibly important and, and we just don't talk about the personal fallout of these things. Uh, gentleman here. Yeah. Um, people might see a pattern emerging, but I'm also a reform candidate and my employer has also withdrawn a promotion from me about four weeks ago. So I was just wondering where that lady was, because I'm also going through the Free Speech Union. <laughs> oh, hey, we will chat a bit. This is actually more of a question for the audience, if that's okay. Yeah, no, no, it's yeah. not. Sorry, no. sorry. You, oh, to our speaker. It's not. Well, no, sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry. No, no worries. I was just wondering, like, it seems like this is happening to more and more people. You know, do we have, actually have any figures and stats of who is being de-jobbed, basically? Um, I, I don't have the, the stats on me or to hand. It's a really good question, and, and that's probably something to look up. I think that the, the, the uptick is going to be exponential. Um, I don't think there's going to be any, 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 uh, any question about that. But I really do think it's what we do and that what we do is sorry to come back to the same basic thing it's how we organize and when i was making this speech and, and, and thinking about what i was going to say i always had obviously i had the free speech union at the back of my mind but i also had uh ncf locals at the back of my mind because that's been one thing i've been going um, around the country doing doing various uh meets and, and one of the things that i really struck me that there was so much support, uh, practical support as well as emotional support as well, people willing to do the kinds of things that I've just said. Uh, hang on. Sorry, yes. And then, and then so this gentleman here, yeah. And then the lady there. <coughs> Thank you. It's, it's uh, more a point than a question in a way. Um, for all those that are being de-jobbed, there's also um, many who don't even get a chance to get the job because they're, um, they're not selected for interview. Yeah. Mm. And I've got a perfect example of such an incident. Um, at a meeting with the head of DEI, mm. um, there's many of us in the room, uh, the, the topic of lack of good candidates came up uh, and they suggested we could use social media um, and she was very enthusiastic. She said, oh, yes, we could root out some of these Trump types. Mm. Uh, and as the lady just pointed out, of course, um, political view is a mm. protected characteristic. Mm. Um, I did push back. Mm. And uh, fortunately, she withdrew the comment. And, uh, and I've heard no more about that discussion of social media use. It's they, they condemn themselves with their own, their own language, actually. And the reason they do that is because they think it's absolutely appropriate to target and victimise people like us, essentially. Yeah. And the lady here. Right 
Uh, Philip, I'm very sorry to hear what you've been through. Oh, I'm really sorry. Um, you say something very important. Um, first, there is a reason for all of this. And second, that these people are very well organized in the education everywhere. Um, so it makes us think probably that there is a lot of international money supporting these movements. It's not just local. So although um, the grassroots approach is very important, you know, um, there, um, there might be a need as well to approach these um, from a practical point of view, together with the international community, because these groups seem to be internationally organized and paid for. Because if you read international media in different languages and so on, you will see the replica of what you are going through everywhere yeah, sure. in the Western world. So yeah. maybe we need to become louder and all together, not through conferences, through an NCF approach yeah. in those countries where yeah. there is an open mind to receive such, you know, projects. Thank you. So I think we should develop NCF internationally. It's a very simple response and I agree entirely with everything you're saying. Um, I, I, I think that the grassroots, as I, as I said, I think the grassroots approach triggers everything else. It works as a kind of catalyst. Um, and I think that we can't just at the moment go to the top and target the money because we're not in a position to do so. That doesn't mean, however, that we might not be in a position to do so in the future. Yeah. Um, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have a coffee break now, um, but before we do, um, Philip, you must know, of course, that NCF is entirely behind you. And... Um, <laughs> Hello, if you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as £3 per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember, to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.